All right, um, Dr. Nova, thank you so much for the very insightful lecture. You cover pioneering, you cover entrepreneuring, and all the way from biology, science, RNA, protein, vaccines. Um, you know, without further ado, I really want to open up the floor for questions. Um, there are two mics on the aisles. Uh, for, for anyone with any um, questions for Dr. Nova, please uh, share with us your name, organization, questions. As we have very limited time, pl please uh, keep to one question per person. Anyone? Let me start the ball rolling by asking the first question. So um, if you are given the magic wand, how would you reinvent scientific entrepreneurship? I think I, I tried to uh, give kind of versions of the answer to that, but I'd say uh, if I had the magic wand and therefore was young again, I would, I would really kind of think about um, being an entrepreneur as a profession as opposed to some avocation or hobby or game. I would think about kind of uh, my, the way I've said, the, my relationship with what is and isn't risky in a more thoughtful way. Um, the, what it takes to advance these ideas is a combination of science, management, leadership, and capital. So how you can also tie those three things together in a way that is cohesive, aligned, um, expecting a lot of failure, and still persevering, these are all things that I think everybody can get better at. And, and I think as a society, we need to be able to talk more about um, I do think that, you know, what, it's easy to say success usually follows a lot of failure, but then if people freak out with failure, it's kind of hard to expect success, and yet that's what happens. So I would say if I had a magic wand, I would use some of it to make sure people actually stopped and thought about these things as opposed to kind of chase the, a lottery ticket. I, I'm, I'm pretty harsh 36 years into this, but the part of this space that I don't like is the degree to which every idea ends up becoming like a lottery ticket. And that from an investor standpoint, there's an expectation that whatever somebody says is gonna work, and if it doesn't, you know, they at least have 100 other lottery tickets, something else might win. But the entrepreneur, their life is the lottery ticket. And so how, as an entrepreneur, can you defy the odds? Can you, can you proliferate or diversify what you're doing? These are all things that I, I let me put it this way, regardless of much go on, this will inevitably evolve and change. This whole field is changing. So I have a lot of hope that in the future we will make new mistakes, not the same mistakes over and over again. Do you see this process as a trial and error process, or could there be a more structured way sort of um, to train entrepreneurs? Well, yes, I absolutely think you can have a more structured way. Um, and um, I think the trial and error terminology is an interesting one. You know, if you were... If you're in the West Coast, they love the word pivot, right? So, I mean, kind of like nature laughs at the word pivot. I mean, it's like, it's one gigantic parallel pivot. It's called evolution. And if you think about it as evolution, and if you think about the result of it as emergence, so that emergence has an interesting property, right? It's hard to predict emergence. And so that flies in the face of devising business plans that are going to predictably deliver value. So if you actually want to work on emergent things, you can expect big outcomes, but the, the road is going to be less predictable. And so I think getting people to understand that and to figure out you know, mindsets, approaches, reward systems that, that work for this kind of work is, is definitely something that you could learn. You may not be, like teaching something and being able to learn something are a little bit different. You can certainly learn it. All right, um, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Nobar. Uh, very insightful, really appreciate um, great ideas and inspiration. So I'm Kathy He, uh, I'm a CEO of Carging Therapeutics. Uh, Carging is a local Singapore biotech um, trying to leverage novel biology and siRNA technology. So we consider ourselves uh, operating outside of the adjacency, hopefully. So my question is, how are the labs at uh, flagship 
different from that of a university academic lab or a pharmaceutical discovery, uh, you know, discovery department lab. So um, you know, they're physically not different, <coughs> but the questions they're asking are a little bit different in that in the early phases of development, we're trying to do experiments that will essentially kill the idea. Um, and while we talk a lot in science about doing the killer experiment and falsifying hypotheses, etc., it's a little bit of an unnatural act if you're doing it in a startup setting or even in a big company setting because people fall in love with their idea and the alternative is usually no idea. In other words, there's no opportunity cost to just you know, keep going. Whereas in our labs, people are working on multiple different things and any given team might work on other projects, other companies. And what we try to do is create an environment within which they're asking the very tough questions as early as possible. So that's one mindset difference. Again, with the science that you're doing is physically the same, but the questions you're asking might be different. Um, we have a significant belief in platforms, as I mentioned. I, in neither in the pharma business or in academia are platforms going to be the result of what one is doing versus findings and published papers or drugs that you can put into the clinic. In that regard, it's very different. Eventually, our platforms will be converted into products, but for us, that comes a little bit later because uh, we, we want the risk mitigation of a platform before we actually commit to one or another drug program. So those are just some of the ways. Um, but in many ways, they're, they're similar. I mean, it's you know, science and innovation. You know, the, the, we are you know, obviously competing over the best scientific minds. We're competing over the best instruments, the best analytical, computational approaches. So in that regard, it's a very big competitive space. Thank you. Sure. Jinping. Hi, Dr. Nuba. Um, well, we have met many years ago while I was in, uh, in ASTAR and uh, over in Boston. May not, uh, you may not remember, but uh, really good to see uh, the achievements uh, uh, since we last met. Uh, I'm now um, a CEO uh, and co-founder of uh, Immunoscape, a TCR-based uh, therapeutics company that leverages on the platform technology right? that is uh, very productive in discovering novel uh, TCRs and uh, with the machine learning uh, and our wet lab approach, you know, have uh, found uh, many functional TCRs. I like your idea of that what if, right, and innovation, and you know, skipping out there in a new brand new space and then you know, creating um, a novel IP. But you know, in innovation too, right, that, um, that there are innovations of uh, combining ideas of, uh, let's say, a phone and a music player to become iPhone. Right. So now that you're out there with your innovation, would it be also possible to see innovation coming back to the known space uh, or to the earlier innovation and create other innovations? For example, right, you have the mRNA platform. Now with the TCRs that, uh, that are novel, that maybe you can um, have uh, new solutions to oncology against solid tumors. So that kind of innovation after you've gone what if, far away, coming back again and creating other another cycle of innovation. Yeah, no, it's great, great, good to see you, great question. Um, and, and that is in fact what we do and what, uh, what happens very often. And so you've given me an opportunity to describe kind of another aspect of this, which is, you know, by the time you convince yourself there's something worth shooting for after you've iterated, and the question then becomes, what is that company gonna become? And what we've learned is never to imagine the company as a single instance but actually is a cloud of possible instances. And you wanna maintain that cloud of possible versions of the company as long as possible. Now, when you execute against some kind of a business plan, one inadvertently kills off a lot of versions of the company. And your job as an entrepreneur leader is to take decisions in a sequence to keep the many versions alive as long as possible, including, for example, going back and doing TCRs with mRNA for solid tumors. And so, now, of course, in the early days, you want to work on things that have a relatively higher chance of success, either because the models are easier to work with or more believable or whatever, or the bar is pretty low as to what you need to get better at. And, but, but eventually, once you start building confidence, you do want to go back and look at all the different things. And so with mRNA, that, those kinds of things are happening. 
another another thing that uh, what you said prompted is sometimes when you imagine something in the future and you come back your coming back actually gives you a different attitude towards what can even be done today so if, it's not as much of a marriage as a different point of view where you kind of say like for example here's something we didn't do right so at, at moderna we we knew that we needed to get much 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 safer and better lmps than what had ever been reported if this was going to be used across 40 different programs i mean <clears throat> if you look at the history of lmps by and large they're toxic by and large historically with sirna people largely gave up on them and there'd been some level of optimization we we, we knew we were going to have to get these things into cells and released and so we did a lot of work on that we could have early on said you know what the other thing we know we're going to have to do is get into many different cells we knew that eight years ago but we kind of said you know what we're going to get to that later and so now there's a big competitive effort to get things into different cells our pioneering advantage could have given us an advantage there as well but we had to make some decisions as to what we're going to do so there's no shortage of combinations you can do and and, and interesting new approaches so I, I completely agree with you thank you yeah. thank you very much for the amazing presentation uh, i'm simone rizzetto i'm a postdoc at the genome institute of singapore and in the past few years we have seen a lot of application of artificial intelligence across the entire um, drug discovery and development pipeline um, in your opinion what do you think will um, we will see the most uh, impact of artificial intelligence across this uh, uh, process of drug discovery and uh, and development well um yeah, I didn't talk much about it, but we do have quite a lot of activities in that space I've had for the last four or five years. Uh, it's hard for me to know what's the biggest impact because that would assume that kind of I could figure out how hard some things are going to be. Uh, but what I can tell you is some of the more exciting things that we've been able to do uh, after several years of working on it. Uh, so one instance I'll give you. There's a company that we formed about four or five years ago called Generate Biomedicines. And the initial premise there was quite unusual, and that is we asked the question, what if you could essentially create a correspondence between protein function and DNA sequence? Now, we all know that there's correspondence between protein function and DNA sequence, because DNA sequence is all that gets passed on, and suddenly, magically, the protein function appears. What we were interested in is, could we actually generate new DNA sequences with predictable protein functions? And moreover, we wanted to do it without knowing anything about folding and anything about what a protein is. So we were heartened by the Go and Chess and some of these early versions of deep learning that does not figure out every interim step between a complex output and the input and can essentially, nevertheless, through pattern recognition, get you there. So we worked on this for multiple years. And more recently, we've incorporated uh, the, the various diffusion model approaches, generative AI. And, and what we are more and more comfortable with the ability to do is in fact that, is to say we can take a target place of a target protein, a target sequence, and essentially computationally generate an antibody, make 50 of them, a whole bunch of them will bind, actually in pretty interesting ways, and a second generation we're making sub-nanomolar, sometimes sub-picomolar binders, essentially without all the different, uh, either starting with human B cells or with various other antibody selection approaches. So I think generative AI as applied to protein generation, then small molecule generation, which is being worked on, RNA, RNA binding, all of those things, I think are more and more gonna be subject to this type of approach. Altogether different is big data, patient data, electronic medical records to try to come up with ways to come up with Kind of staging patients, all those things are also being worked on. So I, I would say there's really hard to say the limit of where these approaches are going to be driving things, and we're very excited by them, no question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nobar uh, Fian, I try, try to pronounce your name correctly. Uh, uh, this is uh, Wei Dong Hao, um, uh, A-STAR uh, Experimental Drug Discovery Center. I'm, I'm very new to the job. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for you and the team at Moderna for bringing the wonderful vaccine to the world, which enabled the face-to-face -face meeting uh, today or make it possible. 
but I think with any innovative uh, discovery or new technology, <coughs> there are going to be a lot of doubter. And I wonder if you can share some of your experience in the last 10 years or 12 years, how you and the team there stay in course and you know, uh, to make, make to the end. And the other question is, uh, a lot of us here, many people believe in the power of the Moderna vaccine. But as you probably, uh, we all know, a lot of doubter in the U.S. how you uh, interact with them or whether they have counter any question they pose to you during a public forum. Sure. So, um, yeah, I think I think that is so, so. The first part of your question, all the ways in which anytime you're doing something that hasn't been done, uh, you have to face doubters. That's that's natural. I mean, you know that you can view science as a process of organized skepticism and you know that's what we do we go to scientific meetings we criticize each other's ideas hopefully politely and out of that comes some form of truth seeking now what i've learned over time though is when people apply dogmatic views in the face of uncertainty see one thing i've learned is that experts are expert at what they know they can also extend what they know over short distances into the future. But when you ask an expert what's going to be possible five years from now, my life experience is that that expert knows nothing more than somebody who knows nothing about the field. Because actually, their dominant view is what's here and now and what is possible next. Unfortunately, experts express their views in very dogmatic ways. And in the early days, for example, of COVID, if you just went back, somebody should do this at some point, and just looked at the media, the number of vaccine experts, virologists, pharmaceutical company executives, CEOs, who got on television and said that vaccines cannot be developed in less than four to five years. If you do that, it will be unsafe. You, you, mRNA has never been inside any single human, which was patently untrue. We had done nine phase one trials already. And on and on and on. But when people hear that, then people said, well, you're going too fast. You're cutting corners, even though it was the NIH with a network of 80 different sites that we're working on doing. So it, it, it's not like you watch it over and over and over again. And one of the things you realize as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, I would say to you is be very careful not to look for validation from experts if your idea is unreasonable. What you can get from experts, very helpful, is how to convince them that your idea is, is viable. And they will have a good sense of what they need to see to believe it. But if you ask them, what do you think, do you think it's going to work? So that's one thing I work. I, and, and I look, the second thing is, you have to know why you're doing what you're doing. And if what you're doing it for is because you want to create, enable a whole generation of products, or you want to impact humans' lives and patients, etc., then some of these things are, you know, ex expected. I mean, you really, you know, one of the, th so failure, for example, you got to learn how to deal with failure all along the way. One of the things that I always tell my colleagues at universities, particularly at MIT, where, where I serve on the board, is what are we doing to prepare our students, the best students, for a life filled with failure? If they're going to work on startups or if they're going to work on big new ideas, they're going to fail most of the time. And, and yet, in school, we reward people and we recognize people for success only. right? So what prepares them for that life of perpetual failure? Failure meaning temporary, hope, you know. And so these are, these are all things that you know you kind of have to come to terms with. Um, but I, you know, Moderna in particular, by the way, if anybody ever goes back and looks at history, for the first eight years, probably even nine years out of our existence before 2010, uh, 2020, everything that was written about the company was negative. Everything. Uh, people told us, "How do you know it's going to work?" They used to interview me. I say, "We don't know it's going to work." They hate that answer because they want you to tell them why you think it's going to work. And if you tell them, I don't know if it's going to work, they have no second question, right? Because like, and then they go, you've not published. If it was working, you'd publish it. And we said, we have like 45 patents. Have you read any of the patents? That's not a publication. It's not peer review. Go, okay, but it's legally binding that it has to be accurate and truthful. If you go read the patents, you're going to see a ton of data. Publishing it is an altogether different thing. We'll publish it when we know it's working, right? So in other words, we've got to have something to publish. But you can certainly go look at what we're doing. So... After a while, you realize, and by the way, Moderna is just one instance. When we have like 40 of these companies, and probably half of them are doing things that have no 
prior president. Like when we started with series, we were going around telling people we think a subset of microbes given orally can reset the gut microbiome. And people said, how do you know that's true? And we said, we don't. And they said, well, then why are you working on it? Because we said, because it might. And if it is, it's going to save lives. And they said, yeah, but if you don't know if it's going to work, why are you, where are you going to get money from? So just, if you just listen to that conversation, you realize, why would you work on something you know it's going to work? And expect some unique explosive outcome. Like once in a while that'll happen. Like once in a while. The next adjacent experiment you do is a eureka moment. But that's like very, very rare. But if you're willing to sustain the criticism, sustain the doubters, and then for a while persist, you can actually do it, turns out, more than once in a while. To your second question about you know, vaccine doubters and anti-vaxxers, et cetera, yeah, that's, been a, that's been a tough, tough problem because the way, at least in the US, this was handled was not very exemplary. The, the degree of politicization of this topic, it became a Republican-Democrat issue, it still is. The degree to which people just would schlep expert after expert to say whatever was you know, their view. <clears throat> I, you know, I think what you realize after a while is that scientists have to be willing to engage in the dialogue, but it takes a lot more sophistication than what scientists can muster, certainly that we can muster, to play with people's brains to convince them of just about anything. And what we can do is educate, inform, do the best science we can, and then people have to make their job. By the way, the, 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 the category of people, the most troublesome to me, are doctors. Many, many, many doctors were basically saying, this won't work, it's not safe, it causes this. It causes... And you'd go like, it's possible, it's possible. But where's the proof of the opposite? They have no standard of proof, they just raised doubt. And so I just think it's a continuous process. I've learned, like, I've learned not to be annoyed with it. I've just learned to engage as best I can. It's very hard to change people's minds. But look, the other thing you have to realize with COVID, I'll say one thing since I'm here. COVID, unlike everybody wants COVID to be like the flu. First, everybody wanted COVID to not exist. Then they wanted COVID to be like the flu. And of course, the difference between COVID and flu from everything we've learned is that the, the long-term consequences of COVID infections, particularly ones that cause some hyperimmune response, are quite serious and unknowable to this day. But when people have done imaging studies in animals, some in humans, and you see spike protein from viral infections all over the place, you have to pause. You don't see that with influenza. So this notion that we're OK now, we've gotten vaccinated, we're going to be cool. Everybody, by the way, whenever I say anything, and Stefan, the CEO of the company, everybody goes, oh, you're just saying it's sell vaccines. The notion that we would say these things to sell vaccines when actually we're, the governments are the ones who sell vaccines, not us. We're not selling any vaccines, right? The governments have to basically say to their people, this is who should take it, this is who should not. It, it's just, it's so I, I worry that there's going to be a few more waves of surprising healthcare kind of consequences. Some of them may be quite costly into people's lives. And, you know, I hope, I hope it becomes like the flu. But in the meantime, if it doesn't, that's one of the scenarios. I, I worry we don't have good therapies, we don't have good long term protection. So we got to worry about that a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Oh, by sure. the way, I'm from the US as well. Super. Hi, Dr. Miramar. Um, thanks for the thought-provoking and inspiring presentation. I'm actually an aspiring scientist entrepreneur. Uh, my name is Shireen. I'm from BTI. Um, so the question that I have is, you know, um, flagship is actually quite interesting because you think about it, people who have made it successful, entrepreneur, is coming back to do basic science or coming back to get people to do basic science. So the question that I have is, you see, right now there's this keyword called use inspired basic science, right? But how about use inspired basic science with commercialization strategy in mind? You see, right now, when I try to come up with something new, I don't know what patent strategy to go for. I don't know, you know, what you do is you kill, try to kill the idea. We don't do that. You know, we just try to see if the idea can float. But we have never successfully bring a company to, you know, CVC, IPO, or success. So we don't know what to look at, what are the criteria to look up for. So my question is, um, is there a way for, like, you know, entrepreneurs who have made it? scientists, entrepreneurs who have made it, to not just go back to entrepreneurs, just mentoring entrepreneurs, but it be like, you know, inspiring even basic research or use inspired basic research with commercialization strategy. I don't know if that's the correct term mm. to actually do the proper basic research that would be disruptive, hopefully. But, you know, look at it with the lens of an entrepreneur, whether it's going to be successful. If you go into a new area, what is your IP strategy? What should you do from the beginning? What kind of research should you do from the beginning so that you can ensure success? What kind of mechanism? Sure. So, 
I mean, I think the question you asked has the answer contained with it, which is that it is something that we should we should aspire to do. Um, so the question is, how do you do that, right? So you know, some of these terminologies, basic research and applied research, um, can be tricky, right? I, if I had the magic wand that I was asked about earlier, I would basically say that everybody working on basic research should think of what they're doing as enabling research. And, and then the applied research people are actually doing, taking the enabling research and applying it to one or another thing. I think calling it basic research, which theoretical scientists have love because they want to be allow, allowed to do this with no contamination of what it could be good for, I think that's a luxury that we don't actually need to be able to do basic research. Because one person's basic research is another person's enablement, right? So we use, I have a brother who's a theoretical physicist. He works on nonlinear dynamics. And you know now they use it to do laser ignition of fusion reactions. That's where he works, close to Livermore. So what I'm saying is, for him, it was important that it be just math and this. But in reality, it's enabling. So first, I actually view all of this as enabling research. When people go to DC uh, from, from our colleagues at MIT and argue for more money for basic research, I just tell them, well, it's just called enabling research. You know, It's all enabling, it's just a question of time. So, and then as to how do you get those people to think about commercialization, um, you know, examples matter, um, impact matters. Like, first people have to be thinking, what impact do I want to have? Do I want to have impact only through publications? Do I want to have impact through, like I said, enablement of other people's applied research? Do I want to have a part of actually getting this to a product? And some people are going to want to do that, some people won't. Many people don't want to do it because they think it's like beyond their, their means. That, I think, I would... This dissuade them of. I think that you know most like I I'm a firm believer that that entrepreneurship now I'm going to use entrepreneurship may be based on nature, but entrepreneuring is based on nurture. I absolutely think that I cannot make you born an entrepreneur. By the way, I'm sure Bill Gates was born an entrepreneur and Steve Jobs was born an entrepreneur, and I think there's a bunch of people who are born phenomenal brain surgeons, but there's a lot more brain surgeons out there who weren't born phenomenal brain surgeons, who are doing a lot of good. I feel the same way about entrepreneurs. And I think a lot of scientists who are willing, there is, look, we bring up scientists to shun the contaminating power of money and usefulness and impact, which is nuts, absolutely nuts, in my view. So I think, you, if you go to MIT, like when I went to MIT in 1983, there were three or four professors who were involved in startups. Now, there's three or four professors who are not involved in startups, right? <laughs> And what happened is, a few Nobel Prize winning professors also had startups. And so when you see a Nobel Prize winning professor driving a fancy car, having a, you know, doing whatever they want to do, you sit there and go, oh, wait a minute, I thought you're supposed to trade one off against the other. So examples matter. Persistent examples matter. And then you know, you've got to get people comfortable with failing. And the society has to be comfortable allowing people to fail. You know, that those, and I know ASTAR does this, I know EDB does this a lot. I've been here a couple of times in the past, going back 20 years. That's an incredibly important role of public policy and government, is to just make sure, like in the US, there was the Bayh-Dole Act. And the Bayh-Dole Act said every single NIH-funded project has to be available for innovation translation. Huge impact. Government sent a message that said, no, I'm not giving you NIH funding so that you work on useless things. I want you to think about it. I want you to make technology available. Similar things, and I know there's many of them here, translational, so I, I don't have a formulaic answer, <coughs> but your finger, you put your finger on a good thing. I think causing people who don't understand the science and who don't feel comfortable inventing and creating to learn that is a lot harder than to teach scientists and inventors and entrepreneurs how to think about commercialization, and, and we need to aspire to do that. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, maybe uh, we can have a last questions from the gentleman over there. I can give quick answers if we want to do two. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, if, if it is there is answer. a version of me that can talk very short. You just okay. haven't seen it. <laughs> okay. Maybe we can afford another question. Okay, that's good. Okay, yeah. Dr. Nuba, thank you very much for your, your presentation. Edward Williams, uh, Goldness Capital. I run the, a uh, BCP fund. Um, I wanted to come back to your beginning where you're basically talking about very, very interesting discussion about um, what I would see as a paradigm shift from investors, right? Um, you're talking about moving away, a distinction between uncertainty and risk, moving away from adjacencies, and you've mentioned several times 
um, which I agree with completely, the view of specialists, you know, experts, and the visibility of moving away from that comfort zone, comfort zone and their impact being, being somewhat diminished in that case. Um, I would love to have been a fly on the wall then when you were discussing early on with your own financial backers about this paradigm shift. Could you maybe talk us through what was the reaction you got when you started talking about these leap of faiths and not looking at things the same way as the natural investment community looks at it? Um, could you just yeah. talk us through how that happened? Um, so, first of all, I mean, this was... So when I, when, when I started Flagship in 2000, I had been involved in six other startups, one that I started and ran for 10 years, and the other ones I, I started as a co-founder in the 90s. Uh, largely due to luck, all six of them either went public or were sold. In the 90s were a good time. If we can only go back to the 90s, I think we'd all enjoy it. Uh, but, but it was a relatively kind of you know, barren land in terms of anything anybody did new kind of you could either find money for or there was interest in. So based on that, when I went out to, to investors to pull together the first pool of capital, what I had told them is that the main value proposition was to systematize venture creation. This was, again, 23 years ago. And I had some ideas on how to do that because I'd been doing it by trial and error in the 90s on my own. And I kind of thought, well, surely this, you know, like I, was, I wasn't going to spend the next 30 years doing serial entrepreneurship. That's the one thing. I kind of felt like everybody thinks serial entrepreneurship is something to aspire to. I think parallel entrepreneurship is even, even more interesting. And it's like playing parallel chess instead of serial chess. Very different mental process. And, and you've got to think at the essence of what every decision is. So I, was, I, I largely got them interested in that. And so the idea was an investor knows what diversification means. So parallel is kind of an interesting concept. Uh, also the learning cycles. Institutional investors understand what institutionalization means which is learning by doing multiple things, iterating. When I was, I was 24 years old, I raised venture capital money in 1987. And I was impressed as a you know, young PhD from MIT as how smart all these people were. I was like blown away. I thought, like, geez, these must be all. And I realized, actually, they're smart because they've seen 100 people before me, and they have massive pattern recognition. They're becoming smart seeming based on what they're experiencing. And then as an entrepreneur, I realized you can't get smart like that because you've got to work on one thing. You know, let alone in life science forever. And then, like, you can't use that thing anymore. So parallel was interesting. So to more specific to your question, how do you get them comfortable going beyond the adjacencies? It took time. We had to build a track record. We had to build some credibility. It turns out in the first seven years, roughly half of what we did was based on things we founded. The other half were things that we seeded and we created academic companies. And in 2008, when, when the proverbial shit hit the fan, the economy kind of melted down, and every, you know, it was risk off for a long period of time, investors were realizing that just kind of like turning the crank was not going to be enough. And we looked at what we had done, and we realized that the things that were more bold and had more risk to them, not less, actu seemingly, actually sustained that period, whereas things that were kind of like a little better than what else was out there got wiped out. Let alone, we also had built a lot of big syndicates of co-investors. And one of the things I realized, you know, quite to my disappointment is that when there's turbulence, syndicated groups of investors who are there in a governing role disagree, right? You're only as strong as your weakest investor, is what I learned the hard way. So the investors who invested in us, what we went out to tell them is we said, listen, we're trying to get good at creating returns on innovation. If we are good at returns on innovation, you'll get a return on investment. We're not trying to create good returns on investment as our own main purpose. Because if we did, what I've just described for the last hour and a half is a overkill, right? You can make money in easier ways than doing this. But we said our principle, our approach is return on innovation. And the people who backed us kind of thought, okay, this is different. I actually do think they were rather thinking they're doing a contrarian bet across all the different things they were doing. But over time, we got better, we learned, they got comfortable. And you know, we raise funds every two, three years. And if we don't do well, we won't get money. And that has a very humbling and resetting element to it, which I quite like, actually. Okay, you, don't, you know, if you, if you think you can create completely new platforms, completely new possibilities, there's almost a dangerous mindset you get into where you kind of feel like you have some special power to do this. And I quite like the fact that we get reminded quite often that we don't. The process, 
the emergent process allows us to do these things. And if the emergent process once in a while creates unusual value, I usually credit the process. And our investors have watched over time the process get better and better, and that's kind of what we got people interested in. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Um, our Friday afternoon is quite short. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. So um, I, I, I want to thank everybody for being here and to thank our partners, uh, SG Innovate, EDBI, and ASTAR, and many others who helped to arrange for this event. Uh, last but not least, please join me to thank uh, Mr. Nova, Dr. Nova, for the very inspiring talk. <laughs> <laughs>